Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Andrew Campbell, and I'm going to discuss treatment for mold and mycotoxins, a paradigm. And this is based on medical and scientific evidence. So this is the real thing. This is not opinion. It is from, it is pure medical science, not uh, hype. Here is what I do. I'm editor-in-chief of two medical journals. I'm a reviewer for the Journal of Immunology Research and the Journal of Pharmaceutical Research International. And I'm on the editorial boards of these other medical journals. This is the typical disclaimer that we always use and that most people use. And then here we go. Mycotoxins, great masquerader of the 21st century. This is what the World Health Organization says. Why? Because really, it's about masquerading as fibromyalgia, as uh, other diseases, chronic fatigue syndrome, and all these other things that it's not. It's really due to mycotoxins. So let me uh, start with this. There's over 400,000 species of mold, but only 25 will cause health problems in humans. And we've been known about this. It, it's in the chapter of uh, 14 of Leviticus in the Bible. And just to let people know, when they say, oh, aspergillus, well, there's 250 species of aspergillus. Cladosporium, 770. Penicillium, 350, et cetera. So it's not one mold, it's a species, okay? And a mold that produces mycotoxins usually produces a series of mycotoxins rather than just one mold. So one mold can make many mycotoxins and one mycotoxin can come from several different molds. There's been a lot of climate change, unexpected weather, floods, uh, hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera. And all these bring on mold infested homes, schools, businesses, and public buildings. So molds are always present in homes or other places that are water damaged. And there were, they are always producing mycotoxins. They can be between the walls, in the attic, in one of the ducts, behind the refrigerator, behind the washer and dryer, all kinds of places that you may not see them. And they multiply quickly. And as they multiply, they release spores and these spores carry mycotoxins. So let me talk about foods because this is something that I get asked a lot about. There's low levels of mycotoxins in many foods. Everyone's known that. That's why you can measure it in urine because that's where we excrete things from the body. And this is in healthy people. So a lot of studies have shown, numerous studies have shown that mo almost all tested mold for in urine is below the tolerable daily intact, intake, which is set by the FDA and all these other organizations that say, you can only get so much. And that's because that's how much can be excreted in urine. So for example, last year, there was a study that showed 91% of all milk uh, from uh, cows had at least one, mini, one mycotoxin. So of course, this is peed out. This is in parts per billion. So don't use a urine test because that only tells you what from the excretion of mycotoxins. In order to know about mycotoxins in your body from the environment you're in, whether it's home or work or other, that is a blood serum test. So the first question you should ask yourself, what is the source of mycotoxins detected in the urine? Okay. And this is because it originates from food. And it's not an indication of body burden of mycotoxins and should not be used as a biomarker of exposure to mycotoxin in water damaged buildings. So size does matter. Hair is 100 microns. Spores are about two to four, usually two to three microns. Mycotoxin are 0 0.1 microns, the size of a virus, okay? So how do we test for viruses? An antibody test. 
You want to test for hepatitis A, B, whatever? You test with an antibody test. You want to test for autoimmune disorder? You test with an antibody test. You want to know about microtoxins? You do an antibody test, okay? And how do these come into you? You inhale them. In the room, there's these things floating around, which are the spores. Remember, they're, they're almost 100 times less thick than a hair. So the very, they get to the deepest part of the lungs, deepest part of your sinuses, et cetera. Dermal absorption gets through skin. You don't get it from ingestion of anything unless you live in certain countries. So the key to solving medical problems caused by toxins is detect the cause, remove the cause, repair the damage. Base your diagnostic testing and treatment on medical and scientific evidence, not on opinions of ex so-called experts, the internet and blogs who write, you should do this and do that. Ask them for references. Ask them for medical science references. They can't give you any. So the most accurate and precise test for microtoxins is antibodies. And you measure both IgG and IgE for 12 different microtoxins. The IgG is for the toxic reaction. The IgE is for mast cell um, uh, uh, stimulation of mast cells, what is called mast cell activation. So understanding antibody tests, let's go to microbiology where there's four categories of pathogens, bacteria, viruses, pathogenic fungi and parasites. After we've been infected and exposed to these, we develop antibodies. However, these four pathogens are living organisms, have cell walls, membranes, etc. And antibodies to these mean sometime in the past you had this problem. Toxins are not alive, don't have cell walls. You don't, uh, mercury is a toxin, pesticides are toxins. They're not alive. They're groups of molecules. So antibodies to toxins indicate your current immune reaction and or colonization, not exposure sometime in the past. The other thing is they tell you what is the body burden. This is very important. So this is a quantitative test, tells you the quantity that is in your body. Once the toxins are gone from the body, the antibody reaction fades away and you get a negative test, usually after about six months for toxins, at least. In treatment, the first thing you have to do in toxicology is get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. A person's health cannot be restored if they continue to be exposed to molds and mycotoxins. No treatment will work under those conditions. Where, are, where do mycotoxins first affect the body? Well, the overwhelming medical and scientific evidence shows that it is in the brain and nervous tissue. Mycotoxin antibodies bind to human tissue, including neural tissue like myelin, cause demyelination. That can be found in a lot of disorders such as um, MS, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. And recent evidence has shown that um, a, a large amount uh, percent of ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is Lou Gehrig's disease is caused by mycotoxins. The same goes for Alzheimer's disease and the same goes for autism. So from childhood to old age, this affects the brain. Treatment paradigm. And I say it's a paradigm because it's not a one size fits all a la Shoemaker and all these other experts who've written books, but they're just books. They're not textbooks. They're books you can buy on Amazon. They're not textbooks. I have chapters in medical textbooks. I don't have a book you can buy on Amazon that tells you all kinds of advice that's unsupported in, in medical science. So the first thing you do is you got to support your brain. Phosphatidylserine, 500 milligrams, one daily to twice a day. Why? 
because the effectiveness of oral uh, phosphatidylserine has been studied in double blind placebo controlled randomized clinical trials. These are the, the gold standard. It enriches myelin, okay? It influences the metabolism of neurotransmitters, which help the brain transmit things and information, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, stimulates and an enhanced performance on tasks, learning abilities, short-term memory in, enhances these. <clears throat> and also it produced significant improvement in short-term recall, immediate memory, vocabulary skills, and the ability to recall words, attention, and even vigilance. Okay. So the next thing you want to use, um, oh, oh, sorry, let me go back here. So the basic is you got to use an antifungal, Sporinox or Itraconazole. Sporinox is the brand name, Itraconazole, the generic 100 milligrams of BID with some food, like a bite of an apple or a bite of a banana. That's only because it, it gets absorbed faster and better with a little bit of food. So that's your basic, that's what you've got to start off with. And you've got the phosphatidylserine. And now I'm gonna add in melatonin. Melatonin people think is for sleep. Yes, it does help you sleep. But some recent studies show that the benefits are that they reduce cellular damage as a result of toxic toxins, such as mycotoxins. And this is a protect, these protective effects. Okay, so, and this happens when you give melatonin as a soul therapy or in conjunction with other potentially protective agents, such as the phosphatidylserine we just talked about. And melatonin's ability to protect neurons from molecular damage due to a wide variety of substances, including mycotoxins. And all of this is from medical science. The third thing you want to add is B-complex. All of it, not one part like just niacin or just B12. No, you want B vitamins in a group because they compromise eight water-soluble vitamins. And the collective effect of all these eight is that it helps many aspects of brain function including energy production, the repair and synthesis of DNA and RNA, genomics, non-genomic and non-genomic methylation, and a lot of this, the production of a lot of, new, of uh, neurochemicals and signaling molecules, very important. Furthermore, human research shows clearly that there's a significant proportion of the population in developed countries, that includes the United States, that some suffer from deficiencies or insufficiencies or of one or more of this group of vitamins. That's even with this rich diet we eat. Okay, so the entire B vitamin group, rather than small subsets at doses that greatly exceed the current government recommendations would be a rational approach for preserving brain health. And that's what we're talking about, supporting the brain. So the next is nitric oxide, N101. And you take one twice a day. Now, why? <clears throat> because it helps the neuronal networks with the ability to make continual adjustments to function of the brain in response to moment to moment changes in physiolo physiological input. So it's, it's signals, it's a signaling in the brain for integrating sensory and homeostatic related cues, control body, key body functions and help improve several neuroendocrine and behavioral abnormalities. So it's a very important, I get it from, and uh, literally the company is called N101. Okay, so 
Now let's, we've talked about the brain and your basics. Now let's go to the body function support. One is magnesium. And I get mag SRT one twice a day. I published an, uh, a study on magnesium a few years back. It's the 11 most common element in the human body. It's needed for three, more than 350 enzyme systems. Okay? And you need it for a majority of bo the body's metabolic processes. The other thing is 80% of the population is deficient in this nutrient. Okay, and just as important, magnesium binding sites have been detected on 3,751 human proteins that are essential for building, repairing, and maintaining body cells. Why are we getting deficient? Because before, water came from wells, and these wells contained minerals, including magnesium. Now we drink bottled, filtered, and whatnot water. On top of this, magnesium is a cofactor for adenosine triphosphate, ATP, which is your key role in energy metabolism, okay? And by which the body breaks down proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, converting them to energy, into energy, okay? It's the energy of the cell, and it's primarily made by our mitochondria. That's our energy factories inside each cell. So it's also required as a cofactor for vitamin C, okay? And vitamin C is a, one, is a wonderful antioxidant nutrient, okay? And it's a cofactor for many other nutrients, zinc, potassium, B-complex that we just talked about, calcium, vitamin D. Without magnesium, it'd be difficult to absorb and use these necessary substances. So, and in addition to magnesium, you take vitamin D3, 5,000 international units daily. It helps in cognitive impairment, which is one of the hallmarks of being affected by mycotoxins. Helps vascular dementia, dementia, Lewy body dementia, and other conditions that develop due to brain cell malfunction or cell death. Remember, mycotoxins first affect the brain. And low vitamin D levels are associated with increased cognitive impairment, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and respiratory diseases. So we do want vitamin D3. In the patients that I see, about a third are low just as is. Third, this is a product, product by, <clears throat> developed by Dr. Steve Sinatra, Stephen Sinatra, cardiologist in um, Connecticut. It's called Omega Q Plus Max. I recommend people take anywhere from two to four of these capsules a day. This is what they contain. DHEA, EPA from squid, not from fish, so it's pure. L-carnitine, curcumin, which is wonderful for as an anti-inflammatory, coenzyme Q10, which is great for the heart and circulatory system, and resveratrol, another very good anti-inflammatory. Now, what else do we want to add? We want to add a good probiotic from spore forming bacilli. And you follow the directions on the bottle, you get it from Megaspore Biotic. So let me tell you, <clears throat> Dr. Red, uh, Dr. Simon Cutting at Reading University published a study showing that uh, less than 10% of lactobacilli and bifidobacterium that come in probiotics are able to get to the colon, they can't they're destroyed by the stomach acid, over 90%. And then there's this publication from University of California, Davis. They went out and bought 16 probiotics from local stores, from the shelves. 
and checked if the strains claimed on the label matched those that were found in the product. Out of 16, there was only one that actually made and matched the what is on the label. And in some of these products, there was pill-to-pill -pill variation in the same bottle. So get the megaspore biotic. By the way, there's no studies that have shown that 200 billion colony forming units is better than 10 billion or that 15 strains are more effective than five and all that. There is nothing, not a single study that shows that. And I go by what is best for my patients. So here's some more information about probiotics. It's effective against SIBO. It increases circulating T and B lymphocytes. This is part of your immune system, okay? Um, they shift the body from Th2 inflammatory to Th1 adaptive. This is also part of the immune system and very important. And these, they improve the pattern recognition to curb autoimmune and allergic immune response. And that's through the toe-like receptors and stimulation and um, stimulation pairs patches. And then they reduce the incidence of irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. So it's a win-win. Last comes vitamin C. We don't make in our bodies, we don't store or make vitamin C. So we have to obtain it from external source. Almost all fruits and vegetables contain some more and some less quantity of vitamin C. Vitamin C helps in depression, especially in children. It reduces uric acid levels. So if you have a tendency uh, to have elevated uric acid levels in gout, this helps you. It reduces the risk for brain cancer, gliomas particularly, and it lowers your lipids. What are your lipids? Triglycerides. This is important. You gotta retest after six months of treatment because what'll happen is, you'll, as you'll see in the beginning, they're positive after six months, the, the, the test results show normal, no more positives. So here we talked about SIBO. Here's a gal, you can see her tummy before octoconazole. Look at it after octoconazole. She took these pictures herself, by the way. Okay, so here's a common complaint that I get. I get about five to 10 of these daily in, in by email, seven days a week. I've seen, you can read it, herbs, binders, cholestyramine, don't work. So in binders, they've done animal studies, in mice, rats, turkeys, ducks, chickens, sheep, rabbits, pigs, that in a laboratory, under laboratory conditions, very precise, some specified binders may remove mycotoxins. There isn't a single study to support their use in humans. So until there is, I can't recommend it in humans. I can recommend it for rabbits, sheets, sheep. If you happen to have a pet duck, sure. But there's no studies in humans. So I can't recommend it for patients. And if you look at the, this is from Google, screenshot I did in December of last year. See what, it, what the CDC government says? It's an unvalidated test. The organic acid test is another one. It's unvalidated. You, it's used in newborn to test for rare inborn genetic defects of metabolism. It's a useless test for mold. I use and help have helped many, many clinicians learn how to detect if a patient should have it, the test or not using a patient questionnaire. It's a great tool, especially the first few pages. And essentially what the patient does is here is you have it on the left. You see on the left side, it says severity. So the patient fills this out themselves and they score from zero to 10 
all of these symptoms. And then on the right side, they write, and when did they first notice this symptom? So it's a great screening tool. What is the take home message here? If you have a patient that's been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, chronic Lyme disease, or has an autoimmune disorder, who's seen a number of clinicians without relief, continues to not feel well, think about mycotoxins and do a mycotoxin antibody test from my micro lab. I wanna also add this in about Lyme disease. I published an article two years ago, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, in 2019 in July in a medical journal about is it Lyme or is it mycotoxins or is it both? And it can be both. And if you want that article, just email me and I'll be happy to send it to you. And if you email me at my email address, I can get, to, I'll have be, just ask for a patient questionnaire. This is the latest study that just came out <clears throat> in March. Molds, mycotoxins, the brain, the gut, and misconceptions. Uh, I wrote this with Dr. Weinstock, who is a professor at uh, Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. The other one is Lyme disease and mycotoxicosis, how to differentiate between the two. Ask for these or any other, and for any references of what I've just said from the peer-reviewed medical literature, not opinion, email me. Great, so I hope this has been a help. If you have any questions on any of these things, please email me. So goodbye, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this. And our my next one is going to be in another three weeks. And at that time, um, we're going to discuss a, a couple of things, including, and this is really um, important, the next webinar is going to be on this issue of Lyme or mycotoxins, or could it be both? What do you treat it with? How do you treat it? Which do you treat first, et cetera? So um, uh, please email me, and uh, I hope you learned something here. Thank you very much.